our death meaning shine to enkindle the institution has been creating sparkles of change and empowerment among the young the first built the artistic baroque style building of 1880 has become the home for the management and teenagers alike the ground floor shows the knowledge of empowerment among the teenagers with the high school education while the first floor houses the jesuit fathers and brothers with their residence and administrative facilities added to this is its spiritual home the artistic and the tourist attraction the world renowned saint aloysius chapel with its fabulous three dimensional interior paintings by brother antony moschini sj it has left behind lasting impression on all visitors and faithful praying before god in out to this spiritual home the degree college is an intellectual milieu for students from across the country and even from abroad with its infrastructure and several attractive graduate postgraduate and research programs of all Jesuit education is to create men and women for and with others. I'm very happy that uh, this institution is going on that path, creating men and women of creativity, imagination, competence, conscientiousness, compassion and commitment. And has been a flagship of all our institutions, the 21 institutions of St. Elvishas. It has been a guiding force in this city of Mangalore and today in the whole of the state. Excellence is the hallmark of our institution and we run a number of courses here in different areas. Each of these uh, areas we have got number of combinations. In BA we have got 11 combinations and uh, in the BAC we have got 15 combinations and in BCom we have got uh, 3 combinations, BA, BBA there are 2 combinations, BCA there is 1 and BO there are 3 combinations with community colleges. And students will have number of ways to explore their studies in these courses and uh, there are extracurricular, there are co-curricular activities and our students really enjoy all these courses that are given to them and excel in their studies.
Mauritius College has established a foreign collaboration cell and our students and our staff are getting benefit from these uh, collaborations. We have student exchange programs, we have got staff exchange programs, we have got outreach programs between these institutions and also research collaboration work between these institutions. That will help our students to really focus outside of their own domain. I really love St. Aloysius a lot. Everybody's so welcoming and so friendly. I truly felt feel like an honored guest and you don't get that experience back home. Everybody's very to themselves and they don't want to get involved in other people's business, but at St. Aloysius, I truly feel like I am an Aloysian. So. <laughs> A very good morning to one and all joined in with us for this webinar. The global pandemic has left us with a situation of total unrest, be it with respect to our work, societal approach, or academic growth. But a problem along with it also challenges our approach to newer ways of handling things. Turning this emergency situation into an occasion to promote international collaboration, to share experiences, knowledge, and resources, Department of Chemistry, St. Aloysius College Autonomous has organized a series of national and international webinars with subject experts for each. And today's being the ninth one in the series on the topic, Chemical Ecology. A hearty welcome to all who have joined in with us for this webinar. I used to pray for answers, but now I'm praying for strength. I used to believe that prayer changes things, but now I know that prayer changes us and we change things. As quoted by Mother Teresa, let us now seek divine blessings for our event.
have this webinar in the virtual presence of distinguished and renowned personalities. We have Reverend Dr. Pravin Martis S.J., our beloved principal with us, and Padma Bhushan Padma Shri Professor Padmanabhan Balram, biochemist, former director of Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore, as a chief guest. At the same time, we also recall the interaction with Professor Balaram during the International Conference on Green Chemistry and Nanotechnology held in our college on 27th and 28th February 2017. It is a delight to have these esteemed personalities with us today. May I now request our principal, Reverend Dr. Pravin Martis S.J. to address us all. Respected Professor B. Balram, the resource person and the renowned scientist, the former director of Indian Institute of Science, my dear members of the faculty, the scholars, researchers, and participants, a hearty welcome to all of you to this international webinar conducted by St. Elvisius College Department of Chemistry. We are in a very difficult time, the time of a pandemic, and all of us are struggling. There's so much of uncertainty and fear. Still, the cases are increasing, but we are here at St. Elvisius College uh, organizing a number of programs online. The Department of Chemistry has organized a number of free online certificate courses already five innovative free certificate courses, more than about uh, 200 uh, institutions and more than 4,000 uh, people have uh, participated in such uh, online free certificate courses. And we have organized many webinars in chemistry on various topics. And we are very happy to welcome you to this webinar on uh, chemical ecology. Professor Balram, was a good, uh, is a good friend of uh, St. Elvisius College. He has come here. We have interacted uh, with him in the college and we had conducted one uh, international uh, conference a few years ago and he was the keynote uh, speaker and he addressed all of us and we were all enthused and today we are extremely happy that he has accepted our invitation gladly and uh, he is present here to enlighten all of us. So thank you, Professor Balram for your generosity and uh, readiness to be with us, to enlighten all of us. Thank you so much. And my dear participants, we are very happy. Uh, you are there always for our uh, programs and uh, you've been uh, participating and engaged, engaging yourself in all these activities so that uh, during this time, uh, our learning does not stop. We continue to learn. In a way, it is a great opportunity for us uh, so that all of us can uh, join hands together in the process of learning. The chemistry is a very interesting subject. And uh, today we are uh, talking about interdisciplinarity and uh, Professor will definitely enlighten us uh, in, the, in terms of uh, the biochemistry, chemistry and uh, various aspects of chemistry. And uh, he's also expert in nanochemistry and definitely all these things will be given to us. I really enjoy his wit and humor. In the talk, you'll also see the way he brings out a number of things uh, and beautifully uh, uh, gives us the importance of chemistry and how we could engage ourselves in this area. Uh, so as uh, we conduct this program, I would uh, especially thank and congratulate the HOD of uh, chemistry, Dr. Ronald Nazareth for his efforts and all the members of the department for organizing this such a wonderful international webinar. And I would also like to uh, thank all the participants for uh, being with us. I would uh, once again urge all of you to engage during this uh, 
webinar without uh, taking much uh, time. I would uh, request now our uh, speaker, our resource person, Professor P. Balram, to take over this session. Thank you. God bless all of you. All right. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear. Yes, yes, we can hear you. Yes. Wonderful. Uh, I'm really grateful to Dr. Nazareth for inviting me uh, because this is one way of keeping oneself active during these continual lockdowns. Uh, I would have very much liked to talk to you about the coronavirus because I have just recovered from the coronavirus infection. And after 10 days in hospital, I have just returned. Uh, six days ago into home quarantine. And I have to tell everybody who's listening that while it was not a pleasant experience, I think the coronavirus is not to be feared. And I think one can get treatment when it's needed. But Dr. Nazareth gave me a very specific task. He said that I should talk to you about chemical ecology, and that is what I'm going to do. So what I will do now is to share my screen, and you'll have to tell me if the slides are visible. Can you see my slides now? And just a minute, so it is, uh, yeah, it is, we can see, we can see it. Okay, wonderful. So if you could see the slides, I'm going to begin with a definition of chemistry. And this definition of chemistry was actually provided in an article by the famous American biochemist, Arthur Kornberg. He's the man who discovered the enzyme DNA polymerase. And in many ways, fired the first shot in the biotechnology revolution by discovering this enzyme. But Kornberg was a lifelong supporter of the importance of chemistry. And he called chemistry the lingua franca of the medical and biological sciences. And this indeed, chemistry is the language with which biology and medicine really move forward. But over a long period of time, chemistry and biology have drifted apart. And uh, Kornberg, towards the end of his life, began to analyze the reasons for this drifting apart of what he called the two cultures of chemistry and biology. And he said that the rift might actually derive from the apparently more right brain dominated character of biologists and the left brain dominated character of chemists. What does this mean? This tells us that the left brain is what is responsible for analytic thought, logic, science, and mathematics. The right brain is for more holistic thought, intuition, creativity, art, and music. And what Kornberg implied in this article was that the chemists were thinking more analytically, the biologists were thinking more creatively and intuitively. It actually turns out that if you work in chemical ecology, which is a field of chemical biology, you're working right down the middle. So you have to be schizophrenic. Sometimes you must use the left half of your brain. Sometimes you must use the right half of your brain. And as we go along, we will see that understanding nature uh, requires a great deal of analysis. It also requires a great deal of imagination. Effectively, a discussion of chemical ecology is really a discussion of chemical communication in biology. Another way of titling this is to call it chemical diversity in biology. And of course, if we want to understand diversity, we must do chemical analysis in biology. In traditional chemistry departments, you will have people who teach you and research the area of natural products. Natural products are molecules found in nature. 
They are not molecules made in the laboratory, but they are molecules that naturally occur in nature. And it turns out that natural products chemistry and field biology come together to form the discipline of chemical ecology. What do I mean by chemical communication in biology? You can have all kinds of communication. You can have communication from one cell in your body to another cell in your body. This is what happens uh, with hormones, which are secreted by one cell type, but act at another part of the body. So endocrinology, which is the study of hormonal communication, is all about cells producing chemicals and communicating with other cells which are distant in the organism. But there is another kind of communication that is between organisms. Uh, an insect and a plant, a bacterium and an insect, or a bacterium and a plant, or an animal and an animal. This is organism to organism communication. And we rarely think about this in everyday life because we are so used to communicating by sound. We communicate by language. But if you think about it for a little while, you will find that in the vast diversity of biology, human beings are the only organisms which communicate exclusively by sound. Most other organisms communicate only by means of chemicals. And the chemical effectors, the molecules, in the case of cell-to-cell -cell communication, we call them hormones. If the brain is involved, we call them neurotransmitters. But organism to organism communications are done by diverse chemicals. They could be volatile chemicals, in which case they are called pheromones, or they could be non-volatile chemicals. Pheromones are what actually attract uh, insects. If you look at bees uh, going towards flowers, you always wonder how did the bee actually decide which flower to go to. Uh, sometimes if you come to the Indian Institute of Science in the month of March, you will find that there's a wonderful display of flowers. In Lalbagh in Bangalore, you will find a wonderful display of flowers. And if you watch carefully, you will find the bees hovering about some flowers, but not about others, which means that the bee and the flower are in fact have established a means of communication, a means of recognition. That is what is pictured on this slide. The chemicals themselves could be complex, like the structure that I have written down at the bottom. You don't have to worry about the structure, but just to know that chemical complexity now leads to chemical diversity. I'll show you another example from nature. Most of you would have seen these termite mounds, which are pictured at the bottom right corner of my slide. What is hanging off that termite mount there is the ubiquitous plastic bag, which we are trying to get rid of. But I suspect after the coronavirus pandemic, a plastic is going to come back in a big way because of the many protective equipment that people need to use nowadays. But look at the termite mound. It's a marvelous construction. It's a remarkable uh, phenomenon in nature. I don't know how many of you have gone near a termite mound and you will find that there are holes in it. And you can actually put your finger into those holes. And if you do so, you will find that the air is distinctly cooler. You will rarely put your finger into the hole because you've been taught in childhood that there are probably snakes living in there and they're going to come out and get you. Uh, this is largely untrue. But the termites now have found a way of constructing structures which are naturally air conditioned by drawing air currents in the right directions. How have the termites put the structure together? In order to do this, they need to cooperate with a fungus, a microorganism, which you can see only under the microscope pictured on the top left of my slide. You the termite, which is down below, and the white fungus, which is shown on the top left, these two now have to communicate with the help of mutual secretions, and then together they cooperate 
in moistening the soil and building this remarkable structure. The founding father of the field of sociobiology, E.O. Wilson, called the fungus farming termites one of evolution's master clockworks, tireless, repetitive, and precise, more complicated than any human invention and unimaginably old. You can't do better with a definition than this. So over millions and millions of years of evolution, uh, termites have learned how to build these structures. They've learned how to cooperate with the fungus. And cooperating with the fungus requires chemical communication. These mass spectra that are illustrated on this slide only tell you that chemists now have techniques by which you can take secretions from the fungus, secretions from the termite, and then try to analyze them chemically. But I want to show you the first paper with which I believe the field of chemical ecology really began. This is called, titled, Biochemistry at 100 Degrees, Explosive Secretory Discharge of Bombardier Beetles. And I will draw your attention to only one author, that is Thomas Eisner, who will appear on a subsequent slide. This paper in 1969 is a paper that I like very much. This is the year that I went to do my PhD. I wish I had read this paper at that time 50 years ago, but I did not. If I had read it, maybe I would have been induced to work in the then emerging field of chemical ecology rather than to learn about chemical ecology more or less after my retirement from the Indian Institute of Science. The Bombardier beetle is very often harassed by fire ants. And so it will be attacked by fire ants, and it has to get rid of the fire ants. What does the Bombardier beetle do? What it does is it produces flame. It is actually a biological flamethrower. It throws out flame, which you can see in the top left figure on the slide, and incinerates the ants. How does it do this? It does this with this remarkable chemistry where you have structures inside the fire ant, which now have the hydroquinone quinone system, and they produce hydrogen peroxide. And eventually hydrogen peroxide is broken down to hydrogen and oxygen, and hydrogen and oxygen are then combined in what is called an explosion chamber. And out comes fire. This is exactly the kind of thing that is used, for example, in the programs where rocket scientists now propel rockets into outer space, you will see that flame coming out, and that is really combustion in action. Biology therefore provides even engineers with many possibilities for thinking. And today in the literature of engineering, you will find that biomimetic approaches are quite popular, and I have just shown a couple of references on this slide. But what really came out from this paper was that biochemistry, which we believe should always be done at low temperatures, can actually happen even at 100 degrees centigrade. And today, of course, we know that there are many organisms which live in thermal springs, which survive quite well at temperatures near that of steam. So biochemistry is extremely versatile. So I come now to chemical ecology. How do we define chemical ecology? We need to define two terms, chemistry and ecology. And the best way to define anything nowadays is to go to Wikipedia. In Wikipedia, a large amount of material which is there is very good and correct. There's a small amount of material which is there, which is incorrect. And it's the task of the reader to really distinguish uh, good definitions and good information from misinformation sometimes. Wikipedia defines chemistry as the branch of physical science that studies the composition, structure, properties, and change of matter. As one who's trained in chemistry, I felt this definition was wonderful, so I could take it. Ecology, which I didn't know much about, and I had to ask colleagues, is the scientific analysis and study of interactions among organisms and their environment. So you can see that if you want to understand your environment, you must understand the chemistry by which 
the many, many organisms in your environment are communicating with one another. Remember, all the plants, all the insects, all the microorganisms, they are all living creatures. And because of this, you have enormous chemical variation in biology. Chemical ecology is a fusion of two diverse disciplines. Field biology, where you make observations, and natural products chemistry, where you try to explain these observations in terms of the chemicals that are involved. Tom Eisner died in 2011, but a few years before he died, there was a special issue of the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences devoted to chemical ecology, and he gave uh, this wonderful preface. He said, new disciplines arise by a convergence of interest. Chemical ecology is the product of a partnership between biologists and natural product chemists united by a shared vision and empowered by complementary skills. I really like this shared vision. We need this in many aspects of human existence. And to be empowered by complementary skills means that by cooperating, we can move forward. He went on to say this vision stems from the realization that all organisms emit chemical signals and that all in their respective ways respond to the chemical emissions of others. He went on to say that chemical ecology is now embarking on the most ambitious and inventive phase of its existence. To stand by and allow natural products chemistry to vanish or even to be weakened is to deny chemical ecology its future. This means that in the teaching of chemistry, it is very important to teach the subject of natural products chemistry. How are complex molecules synthesized in nature? How does one determine the structures of complex molecules? What is the biological function of these complex molecules? But before I move to that, I must very quickly tell you a little bit about an area of cell biology, which is sensory perception and signal transduction. And uh, on the top left of this slide, you see a picture entitled Five Senses. I would leave it to you to see where I have taken this picture from by going to Google. But I've actually taken it from a kindergarten textbook. Because you teach children about the five senses, touch, sight, hearing, smell, and taste. How do these five senses operate? These five senses operate by chemical or physical stimuli acting on a receptor molecule, which in biochemistry is invariably a protein. And subsequently, this results in a cascade of chemical reactions, biochemical reactions. This is the process called signal transduction, where a chemical or physical signal is now transduced into biochemical signals which then affect cellular The small connectivity problem from the uh, side of the presentation. Uh, just wait for a while. There is a power phase there, and uh, we'll come back very shortly.
Can you see the slides? Yes, sir. We can. We can. Now. Can and you can hear me. Very good. I am so sorry. Uh, power went off here. Uh, so as I was trying to explain, uh, the five senses are really operate when chemical or physical stimuli are recognized by a receptor molecule, a protein, which then subsequently results in a number of biochemical reactions. This whole process is very widely studied in cell biology today and is called the area of signal transduction. But chemical communication in biology really requires the biosynthesis of diverse molecules. You need to characterize their activity and chemical structures. You need to recognize the mechanisms by which effector molecules are very specifically recognized by biological receptors. This is a very high specificity of biological receptor ligand interaction. Uh, Emil Fisher, whose picture I've put at the bottom of the slide, gave us a famous lock and key hypothesis for understanding molecular recognition in biology. He said molecules fit into other molecules just the way locks fit in, uh, keys fit into locks. So if you have many locks and many keys, you will find there's a great specificity of that kind of interaction. So that specificity specificity now resides in the structures of the molecules. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about, uh, about that. But let's go back to this slide on the on sensory perception. This is a bit more detailed. Now you can see that in your tongue you have receptors which will very quickly recognize taste. So capsaicin, what gives the red chili its uh, pungency is very readily recognized by the tongue. If you have a rose, you can recognize the smell with your nose. These now are extremely sensitive detection system. The eye, on the other hand, recognizes photons of light which fall in the visible spectrum with a maximum absorption around 550 nanometers. But these photons now impinge on a chromophore called retinal in your eye, which is bound to a protein. So once again, even the photons now really recognized by another molecule. Then there are mechanoreceptors. You can try this experiment. You can press your hand, press your palm, and you know that you're pressing it. How do you know? Because you are now sensing that mechanical stress that you are imposing on your skin. That is again conveyed to proteins which are called mechanoreceptors. And in the ear, you have uh, follicles which now really sense uh, sound frequencies. So biology uses both chemistry and physical stimuli in wonderful ways to make us see the world around us. We'll come to the molecules themselves, because many of you are studying chemistry, and here I've put three molecules. There's only one thing which characterizes three, these three molecules. They all have very complex structures, and their structures are so complex that to anybody who has not studied chemistry, they look like some impossible figures. But the molecules that I have here, strychnine, cholesterol, and erythromycin, which is an antibiotic, a macrolide antibiotic, all these are found in different places, strictly from plants, uh, cholesterol from many products, animal products, and uh, erythromycin is produced by a bacterium and it is an antibiotic. 
a word about erythromycin. In the coronavirus pandemic, you will find that there is a drug being given, an antibiotic called azithromycin, uh, which is being given to patients. That belongs to the same family of molecules as erythromycin. Then we have the alkaloids. Look at the alkaloids, tobacco, coffee, cocoa, and the opium alkaloids, opium poppy. All of these come from plants, nicotine, caffeine, cocaine, and morphine. You might now ask the question, all these are being used by human beings. Most of these should not be used by human beings. Nevertheless, they're being used by human beings for a very long time. Is the plant making it for human benefit? The answer, of course, is no. The plant is making it for an ecological reason. And it is understanding that ecological reason, which is the subject of chemical ecology. Why do plants produce this diversity of chemicals? How does it help? Let's take a look at two molecules which all of you are familiar with. Capsaicin from red chili and curcumin from turmeric. Today you will find that curcumin is being advanced as being a valuable molecule for a variety of therapeutic purposes. But if you look at these two molecules, even if you don't know any chemistry, you should see that the left-hand side of these molecules look very similar. In the case of curcumin, there appears to be a symmetrical center. The left and the right seem to be very similar. But in the case of capsaicin, only the left side of it is similar to curcumin. And it turns out that these are what are called vaniloid molecules, and they all bind to a receptor that we have called the trip ion channel. So nature uses chemical structures to convey information. And this information then is important for interactions between organisms. Chemistry can provide other surprises. There is three dimensionality in molecular structures. On the left, you have a terpenoid, which is produced by coriander. On the right, by lavender. Two entirely different parts and they have two entirely different sets of properties. But if you look at the two structures, they look very similar with one difference. One is the mirror image of the other. And the mirror image problem is what you study in stereochemistry, you study chirality, and you study optical activity. So effectively, what we are doing here is revisiting the chemistry of natural products. Natural products can be produced by microorganisms, they can be plants, they can be produced by animals. Biochemistry itself talks about metabolites with two terms, primary metabolites and secondary metabolites. Natural products are generally classified as secondary metabolites. And I found this definition 30 years ago in the literature where the authors described secondary metabolism. And they said that it represents the splendid idiosyncratic diversity of nature endowing different species with specific solutions to biological problems. So this is now chemical diversity operating to solve many, many diverse biological problems. You might ask, how many molecules are there in chemistry? I stopped doing this some years ago because chemical abstracts took away this counter from their website. But there are millions of chemicals which are produced in the laboratory, and there are millions of chemicals which are produced in nature. So we can ask some questions. How many chemicals are produced in nature? This is what you would call chemical space. How many living organisms are there in nature? This is biological space. How are these chemicals synthesized? That is biosynthesis, biology and enzymes. Why are these chemicals necessary for the organism? This defines the biological imperative. How are the chemicals of one organism recognized by the target organism? This requires receptor proteins. So all of these questions which I've asked, the answers to these questions are what are being sought in the field of chemical ecology. 
Let's look again at the literature, biological space. How many organisms are there? In 1992, one of the high priests of biology, E.O. Wilson, said there were 1.5 million. About 10 years later, he had multiplied this number by a factor of 10 and said that there are over 10 to 15 million organisms in nature. Chemical space, how many natural products are there? What is natural product diversity? An estimate of a little over a decade ago suggested there might be a million, but it's quite possible there are many more than one million. If we identify biological roles for natural products, we search for activity, we look for important activities like antibiotic activity, anti-cancer activity, anti-diabetic activity, we are doing what is called bioprospecting. On the other hand, if we identify molecules, responsible for mediating observed biolo biological phenomena, we are in the subject of chemical ecology. So chemical ecology and bioprospecting are very, very closely related because both involve the study of natural molecules. Now you might ask, how many biological species are there? And the correct answer to that, of course, is I don't know. When I asked a colleague of mine who is pictured on the top right of the slide, he is an ecologist and he's a theoretical ecologist. He sent me this paper and this paper has a very interesting title. Estimating the number of unseen species. How many words did Shakespeare know? And the way these mathematical statisticians have done this is they asked how many different words did Shakespeare write? And how many of these appeared once? How many appeared twice? How many appeared uh, multiple times? And then using a statistical model, they came to the conclusion that Shakespeare knew at least 35,000 words. It's interesting to ask the question, how many words does each one of us really know? Then in this paper, the unseen species are words that Shakespeare knew but did not use. And they then concluded that you could have an estimate of the number of words that Shakespeare knew, he knew 35,000, he used only 31,534. Whether you believe these estimates or not, they are based on fairly complex arguments. The same procedure can be used to estimate the number of unseen species in ecology. I'll turn to another important problem. That is, how do complex molecules get made in nature? I've taken the red chili molecule capsaicin. On the left-hand side, there is a set of chemical reactions. On the right-hand side, there's another set of chemical reactions. And the chemicals produced at the end of all these reactions are joined together to give you capsaicin. If you are in an organic chemistry department, you will look at all the chemical structures. If you're in a biochemistry department, you will look at the arrows where there is the name of an enzyme. Phenylalanine, ammonia, lyase is the first enzyme. And this is because biochemists focus on the enzyme catalysts which facilitate these reactions. Organic chemists focus on the intermediates at each synthetic process. If you integrate these two, you will realize that for every biosynthetic step, you need an enzyme. And what are enzymes? They are proteins. How are proteins made? They are made with information encoded in genes. So a plant which produces capsaicin now is investing a huge amount of genetic information in making this molecule, a huge amount of biochemical energy in making this molecule. And therefore, this molecule must be important for the plant because of the chemical and biochemical investments that it has made. That is the important point to understand about secondary metabolites. So we are really discussing two subjects. Biology on the one hand, which deals with organisms and behavior, and chemistry on the other hand, which deals with the details of the molecules involved. How are these two subjects connected? They are connected by two of the most important areas of modern biology. Genetics on the one hand, which descends from the work of Gregor Mendel, 
an evolution by natural selection which descends from the work of Darwin, uh, both of these in the mid 19th century. And they are then integrated by the chemistry of heredity. The chemistry of heredity is what I pictured at the bottom of the slide. Oswald Avery's discovery of DNA as the genetic material. And the Watson and Crick discovery of the double helical structure of DNA. The double helical structure of DNA immediately tells us how information can be encoded and eventually transferred from generation to generation in biology. Avery's work, of course, is even more fundamental. It tells us what is the molecule which is actually involved in information transfer. But if you think about it, natural variations and selection on the basis of chemical phenotype happen in a Darwinian manner at molecular level. And then they are, con they are now mutational uh, effects are conveyed through generations by genetics. So it is genetics and evolution which connect biology and chemistry. So if you have a substrate in a biosynthetic pathway going to a product, you need an enzyme. And if you need an enzyme, you need a gene. So for a multi-step biosynthetic pathway, genes encoded, uh, unique enzymes encoded by separate genes are required. So these genes must now all be arranged in a cluster and they must be expressed at the same time. So the huge amount of wonderful biological control of biosynthesis. I summarize something that Francis Crick said many, many years ago. He said that the main function of proteins is to act as enzymes. And he said this over 60 years ago in 1958. And this is what he said. It is at first sight paradoxical that it is probably easier for an organism to produce a new protein than to produce a new small molecule. So the secondary metabolites are more difficult to produce than the enzymes which are involved in the various biosynthetic pathways. And then, of course, he concluded by saying that there seems little point in genes doing anything else but protein synthesis. This is a sort of visionary statement of uh, which I think could be studied in chemical ecology. Biochemistry has not been a popular subject in the last many years. Molecular biology, biotechnology, these are the subjects that people talk about. And at the turn of the century, Sidney Brenner, one of the founding fathers of molecular biology, wrote this very interesting article called Biochemistry Strikes Back. And he said that I once made the remark that two things disappeared in 1990. One was communism, the other was biochemistry and that only one of these should be allowed to come back. Now, of course, it's likely that uh, both communism and biochemistry are coming back in different parts of the world, and everything happens in a slight way. But he then added, we do not have to resurrect biochemistry, and it will flourish because it provides the only experimental basis for the causal understanding of biological mechanisms. In chemical ecology, biochemistry lies at the heart of chemical ecology because we are asking questions about how organisms communicate by means of chemicals and how does this kind of communication benefit the organisms and their environment. So this just summarizes what I said. I won't dwell on it anymore, but random mutations in genes and natural selection of adaptive phenotype result in structural variations in the natural products produced by biological organisms. And this is how diversity really uh, comes about. I'll give you one example, and this is the most famous example in chemical ecology. The female silk moth, in order to mate with the male, attracts the male silk moth by emitting a chemical. This is the first pheromone which was identified. This goes through the air, and then a gradient of the pheromone is sensed by the male silk moth, which then comes towards the female silk moth. You can see now on the right-hand side of the picture at the bottom, the male silk moth on the right is in fact now in a state of excitement because it has sensed the pheromone. The pheromone is a very simple molecule called bombicol. And this was the first pheromone 
ever characterized in the literature of chemistry. This is the paper in German in which Adolf Butenandt reported the structure of Bombicol. I put this up because this paper appeared about 60 years ago. Students of chemistry should know how chemistry has transformed in the last 60 years. In this paper, which is all of this page, appearing in the Zeitschrift Naturforschung in 1959, small paper in German, Butenandt reported the Bombicol structure. Now, of course, when I was trying to teach this to students in chemical ecology courses at the National Center for Biological Sciences, I couldn't anymore translate this German paper because I'd forgotten whatever German I'd ever learned in my youth. And then, but it's so easy nowadays because you can go to Google Translator. I went to Google Translator and got this translated. And even if the grammar is not done correctly, it turns out that if you know a little bit of chemistry, you can now find out how Butenandt has determined the structure of Bombicol. What did he do? All he did was to get, a, get enough natural material. He needed glands from the female silk moth. How many did he collect? 500,000. He got them from Japan. He then ground them up. And after this, he got some material. But when he got some material, this material could not be visualized. Very small amount. So what he did was he conjugated it to an organic dye, an azo dye whose structure you can see in the bottom half of the slide. This azo dye now is yellow colored. So now he had added color to his molecule and he could do chromatography. And then he followed the yellow color and isolated six milligrams. Six milligrams after adding the dye from 500,000 glands is an enormous undertaking. He then began to degrade this molecule. He broke it up by hydrogenation, by treatment with formic acid, potassium permanganate, and so on, and broke it down into smaller pieces and then identified the smaller pieces and put them back like a jigsaw. This is the way natural product structure determination was done 60 years ago. This is the way strychnine, cholesterol, all those structures were determined. These are heroic efforts of organic chemistry at that time. But then for science to progress, we need methods. And the founding father of chromatography, Mikhail Schwedt, the Russian, he said that an essential condition for all fruitful research is to have at one's disposal a satisfactory technique. He then quoted in the French from Descartes, who said all scientific progress Progress. And Freeman Dyson, who died recently, a theoretical physicist, said that science is often driven by new technology rather than by new concepts. And this is what has happened over the last 50, 60 years in chemistry, where enormous numbers of techniques have entered both chemistry and biology, many of them coming from physics. I'm just going to show you those techniques because they're the heart of structure determination. X-ray crystallography, Ronchen discovered X-rays at the turn of the century, around a little bit before 1900. And a few years later, von Laue found that crystals diffract X-rays. And then a couple of years later, the Braggs discovered that X-rays could be used to determine crystal structures and determine the structure of sodium chloride. I've only illustrated this with a few Nobel Prizes, a Braggs in 1915. By 1960, Erutz Kendu had got this for the structure determination of globular proteins. A couple of years later, Dorothy Hodgkin for the very important structure determinations of penicillin and vitamin B12. And then by the 1980s, two mathematicians now determined structures. The most recent Nobel Prize, which most of you would know about, was that which Venki Ramakrishnan shared for the determination of the structure of the ribosome. So X-ray crystallography has been at the heart of structure determination. The other method which has been enormously useful in this area is NMR spectroscopy. And this began again in physics in the mid 1940s as a method for determining the magnetic properties of atomic nuclei. In 1944, when Rabi got his Nobel Prize, nobody could have foreseen that this method developed in physics to determine 
the esoteric magnetic moments of atomic nuclei is now going to eventually impact medicine in a way that is unimaginable. It went through physics, through chemistry, to biochemistry for Wuttrichter's Nobel Prize, and eventually in 2003, Lauterbur and Mansfield got the prize for magnetic resonance imaging. Today, you do MRI imaging, uh, uh, the great facility in almost every hospital in Bangalore, in Bangalore, and every other place. So these are methods which have come from physics, migrated through chemistry, ended in biology. The technique which is now revolutionizing biology at the moment is mass spectrometry, which began with J.J. Thompson's work on the electron, moved through Aston's work on the isotopes, and then eventually to the discovery of the ion trap by Paul and Demelt, and eventually the soft ionization methods which came in, which allowed you to take a molecule into the gas phase and make a mass spectrometry measurement. So today, chemical analysis is done by all the complex instruments which you have on the right side of the slide. But the most important part is to separate substances from mixtures, eventually to chromatography, and then apply all these methods molecules. This is usually easier said than done, even though chromatography has improved dramatically over the last 50 years with the introduction of high-performance liquid chromatography. Activity-guided fractionation of natural extracts means that you must fractionate a, nat a natural extract and then eventually get a pure biologically active substance. You must have a bioassay to follow your purification. And this is a slow and very tedious process. When I was asked to give a lecture in a college on chromatography some years ago, I looked at AJP Martin's Nobel lecture where he got the prize for inventing paper and thin layer chromatography. And he said that nothing is too difficult as long as someone else does it. So it turns out that chromatographic purification is easy as long as you have a bunch of students who are very painfully and patiently working in the laboratory to separate complex mixtures. I will only show you one experiment on the origins of life, which was done by Sandy Miller many years ago, because this is relevant to the field of analysis, where he took a mixture of gases, methane, ammonia, hydrogen, and water, put them in a glass bulb, and passed a spark discharge through them. He then analyzed the brown mixture that he got at the bottom of his flask. In the days when he did this in 1953, he found amino acids. And this was called the origins of life experiment because the building blocks of biochemistry had now been produced uh, in a mixture of completely inert gases with lightning passed through them. 50 years later, the same sample of Miller, which was preserved at the University of Chicago, was analyzed, and now they found hundreds of molecules which they could now identify, many, many different amino acids, some of them found in nature, and so one does not know what the origin of molecules really is in biochemistry. Today, you can use these methods to analyze meteorite extracts. This was done some years ago on the Murchison meteorite, and as many as 15,000 distinct chemical formulae have been identified. This is possible because of the high precision with which mass spectrometry is able to determine masses. You can determine masses to the third decimal place. And if those of you who are students, remember that the mass of hydrogen we take as one Dalton. If you can determine it to the third decimal place, you have got a very accurate mass determination. You can then distinguish between a nitrogen which is 14, and a CH2 group, which is also 14. So you can determine them by going to uh, higher and higher decimal places. In concluding this kind of presentation, I will just show you some example of a problem that I have been interested in, and that is to analyze the many, many toxic molecules which are produced by marine coast snails. Even off the coast of Mangalore, you will have many of these. And uh, snails are organisms which can't move very well, and at the bottom of the sea, they don't move very quickly. But they need to eat. And the only way they can eat then is if they catch their prey, immobilize them. And once the prey is paralyzed, they can slowly engulf them. So they inject their prey with a mixture of paralytic toxins. 
This problem was brought to me by Professor K. S. Krishnan, my close colleague, who died some years ago, but he introduced me to this area and suggested that we look at these molecules because they are small proteins, uh, chronotoxins, and they contain multiple disulfide bonds. This is how the snail produces them. The snail produces them in this tubular structure, which is called the venom duct. This is where they are biosynthesized. It uses this bulb to press this toxin out and coat a harpoon-like structure and then throw the structure, uh, throw the harpoon onto the prey and paralyze the prey. They, all the molecules here act at the neuromuscular junction. There are large numbers of molecules and large numbers of snails, so there's enormous diversity. And you can summarize this by saying many snails, many peptides, many enzymes. And we've been trying to understand these peptides and enzymes from diverse species collected off the coast of India. Professor Oliveira, who started this field in the United States, called this kind of work as chronotoxinomics uh, in order to add the subscript omics to everything. So effectively, what we're doing here is to sequence peptides from natural mixtures. We use high-performance liquid chromatography. We use mass spectrometry. And then these peptides are heavily post-translationally modified. Therefore, uh, one needs mass spectrometric methods to be able to characterize them. I don't have the time to describe the methods, but I will just tell you that these methods allow you to determine high-resolution masses, which you can see at the top of the slide. And for my numbers, you can see that we are determining masses very accurately. You'll also see that these methods are very sensitive. So you need very little material in order to get very good mass spectra. And if you have chromatography integrated with mass spectrometry, you can analyze mixtures directly without separating them uh, in the laboratory, but you can do online separations. And eventually, once you have molecules in the gas phase, you can give them some energy and break them. And once you've broken them, you can look at the fragments, piece them back together to get sequences. That's the kind of work that we've been doing. But this work can also be aided by molecular biology because you can isolate messenger RNA, convert it to complementary DNA, and then generate what is called a transcriptome library because you can break this DNA into fragments, sequence them, and then use computational methods to put the sequences back and determine uh, what are called uh, putative gene sequences and putative precursor protein sequences. This kind of transcriptomic analysis is analogous to the problem that I've illustrated on the left-hand side of the slide. Imagine a manuscript in which you have forgotten to number the pages, and there are a thousand pages, and you bring it and keep it on your desk, and it all blows away because you've got the fan on. All the thousand pages are scattered all over the floor, and you have to arrange them once more. You haven't numbered them, so how do you do it? You take the first page that you pick up, read the text, you take the second page and ask whether you can find a contextual connection. If you can't, they're too set, they're far apart. If you can, they're close together. And that's exactly the kind of algorithm which is used in piecing together uh, DNA sequences from transcriptomic analysis. Of course, takes advantage of the fact that base pairing constrains the ways in which nucleotides bind to one another. So the Watson Crick base pairs now are at the heart of all these algorithms which allow you to, uh, to read along uh, sequences. Once you've got a sequence, you know which part of the molecule might be your toxin. You can then estimate a theoretical mass and compare it with your experimentally determined mass. You can also go back and interpret your mass spectra in terms of the sequence. So this is the kind of work that we've been doing with snails collected off the southern coast of India, most of the coast of Tamil Nadu. And we have been examining the enzymes involved in the post-translational modifications and so on. These molecules are important because they act at the neuromuscular junction and in this diversity of molecules, there's a specific molecule for almost every receptor and channel in the central nervous system. And that is, uh, and one molecule has gone into clinical practice, econotide from Professor Oliveira's group at Utah. And uh, this is a rather complex uh, molecule. 
But we'll come back to chemical ecology. Why does the snail make such a diversity of molecules? This is because it does not know which molecule might work on the prey. So making a library of molecules is useful. But the prey also now does not want to be paralyzed by the snail. So it will also vary the receptor targets which it generates. As a consequence, both toxin and receptor sequence evolve under the selective pressures of evolution. And there is a hypothesis in evolutionary biology, which I like, which I will introduce you to, called the Red Queen Hypothesis. And the Red Queen Hypothesis is derived from Lewis Carroll's book, Through the Looking Glass. This is the sequel to Alice in Wonderland. If there is anybody who listening to me who has not read Alice in Wonderland and Through the Looking Glass, I think they should go back and look. Because on almost every page, you will find an allusion to something in science. In this particular part of the book, Alice meets the Red Queen. And they find that they are on a checkerboard, on a chessboard, black and white squares alternating. And Alice says, look, this is a wonderful game. I can see knights, bishops, and all standing. So why don't we just play the game? So the Red King grabs Alice by the hand and they run around the board. And after they have run around the board for some time, Alice, who's a very good scientist, she makes an observation. She says, we've been running for some time, but we still seem to be in the same place. But the Red Queen is a true professor. She has an interpretation for every observation. She says, here you see, it takes all the running you can do to keep in the same place. Think about this for a moment. This is biology. Predator toxins and prey receptors evolve over time. The more they change, the more their interactions remain the same. While the structure, the precise chemical structure of the toxin and the precise chemical structure of the prey receptor may change. The interactions between the atoms in these structures are more or less governed by what one might call the immutable laws of physics and chemistry. So this is a game that is played in nature, in biology between predators and prey, both of which have to survive. And the survival-driven uh, phenotypic selection then determines the nature of molecules that we find at any time. In the context of today's pandemic, I would like you to think about this, because what we now have is we have a predator, the coronavirus, and we are the prey. Where does the coronavirus bind? It binds to specific cellular receptors. Now you can see that over a long period of time, not the kind of period of time which we are accustomed to, which is very small, a few decades, but over periods of thousands and millions of years, evolution and natural selection work on all the organisms on Earth, and then eventually a kind of equilibrium is, is reached. Nature can be very strange. The molecules that we have found from the cone snail have also been found in the wings of the monarch butterfly. There is no obvious biological connection, except that this toxin expressed in the wings of the butterfly prevent predators like the orchid mantis and the gecko from actually chewing on the butterfly wings. So maybe uh, evolution has simply picked molecules from one place and planted it elsewhere. Sometimes nature can give you wonderful gifts. This is our tennyson, the Chinese antimalarial which was discovered by a very large group of Chinese scientists working during the Cultural Revolution, of whom the public figure, uh, everyone's recognized as you, you too, who won the Nobel Prize many, many years later. Artemisinin was discovered in a very interesting way. The extracts of this plant were known in Chinese literature uh, to be useful for malarial fevers. And uh, they tried extracting substances from here and administering it to, I think, rats which had been infected with a malarial parasite. And they got variable results. When the results were variable, Yu Yu Tu went back and read the ancient Chinese literature, and she found the prescription. A handful of plant material is mixed with two liters of water, 
Then you make a juice and drink it. The Chinese then discovered that they had all the time been doing the classical organic extraction, where you take plant material, put it in a succulent extractor, and boil with organic solvents. Now, of course, what you had to do was to make a cold decoction and not a hot decoction. And then the results were reproducible. Many years later, when the structure of artemisinin was discovered, the structure of artemisinin is at the bottom right of the slide. You can see this remarkable organic peroxide. I began this lecture with Eisner's work on the Bombardier beetle where the beetle produced hydrogen peroxide. You will realize now that peroxides are explosive substances and therefore with a little bit of heat, this molecule just disintegrates. So empirical knowledge sometimes can provide you very valuable clues on chemical isolations. There have been all kinds of interesting molecules now reported in the literature in the last few years. Here is one which is made by an organism which is up the human nose. It is a common cell which actually colonizes the human nose, but it prevents pathogenic organisms from colonizing the human nose. So nature provides pathogens, but nature also sometimes provides the means by which these pathogens can be attacked and the structures can be determined. I've come to the end of my presentation. I just want to conclude by showing you this slide. This pictures one of the most important figures of biology, Alguz, who discovered the archaea. And the archaea now constitute the third branch of the tree of life, along with bacteria and eukarya. So if you look at phylogenetic trees, this is what everything looks like. All animals, plants, everything come under eukarya. Now, when he died some years ago, I found this tribute on the internet to him, and one can't do better. Whoever had put up his picture in the Tree of Life had said, nature is to be found in her entirety, nowhere more than in her smallest creatures, and attributed this quotation to the Greek Pineal. I just like to paraphrase this to say that chemistry is to be found in her entirety, nowhere more than in nature's smallest creatures. So you are likely to find the greatest diversity of chemistry in microbiology. With this, I'd like to conclude what I think was an introductory presentation to the area of chemical ecology, where chemistry and biology are intimately related. I have only one slide of acknowledgement which is to the two institutions where I have worked for over 40 years at the Indian Institute of Science at the top left, and for the last few years in my post-retirement phase at the National Center for Biological Sciences in Bangalore. I must acknowledge these institutions for giving me the facility to do whatever I like. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for this wonderful, inspiring presentation. It is truly uh, wonderful to start with, you started with such a basic concept so that we all could, which are coming from heterogeneous background, could understand. I'm sure this inspired many to come out with some question. Can we take up a few more, few questions, sir? Sure. Yeah. Uh, so, Gerald want to just interact. Joseph Gerald. Can you hear me, sir? Yeah, yeah, can, can you. Uh, sir, uh, thank you for the wonderful uh, uh, presentation, sir. Actually, uh, my interest uh, in this uh, uh, topic is about uh, uh, the, the, there are different animals and uh, they are uh, sensitive to different uh, realities. Let's say dog. Dog is very much sensitive to infrasonic sound and they are able to detect uh, uh, these infrasonic sounds. Uh, let's say earthquake or tsunami and so on. So can we, uh, this is uh, typical of chemical uh, activity which is taking place in the brain of uh, the dog, for an example. Can we pull all these information? Uh, can we have an access to all the information uh, of how different animals feel to different realities and pull them together and have an information about uh, different kinds of realities? So that's the question. Sir. Yeah, I think the question that you're asking is where organisms communicate by sound, uh, processing of the sonic signal 
eventually by the brain, which then leads to a response by the organism itself. Many cases, these are not well studied at all. At the other extreme is language. In case of human beings, that is extremely complicated. But in the case of sound, there have been many, many attempts to sort of study specific insects, specific animals with respect to their responses to sound. Uh, it can be done, but it then requires that you do at some stage measure electrophysiological responses at the same time by giving the sound stimulus. This can be done and is being done in some cases. But it's very much more difficult than the experiments that one does when you're giving direct chemical stimuli. Mm -hmm. uh, so another question, uh, can we use the chemical ecology concept mm -hmm. to control the coronavirus? Is it connected? You know, chemical ecology, or I would really say biology taken over long time spans, eventually results in control. But you may not like the results of that control. See, it, it is, uh, you have to think about this a little more carefully. Uh, on Earth, the only organisms which have attempted to transform their environment, not adapt to their environment, are human beings. Because human beings, by virtue of the fact that they have developed brains to the extent that they're able to develop new knowledge and use that new knowledge to do environmental control, have in many ways damaged the natural environment. What we call progress is not necessarily what biology wants. That's my answer. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes. So there is one more question from Pragnya. Can we apply chemical ecology concept to study Neurobiological disorders. Yes, I don't think I wouldn't use the term chemical ecology concepts. I would really use the term a chemical biology concepts. Okay. I think all areas of biology require chemistry and uh, signal transduction, uh, neurological disorders. All of these are being very actively investigated now. And the concepts are pretty much the same thing. There are molecules responsible. Uh, there are uh, external effector molecules sometimes. There are internal effector molecules. There are receptor molecules. So all of this is being studied. Uh, One more last question. We'll take it up, sir, about the career options. They're asking most of them are chemistry or chemistry related students here. They're asking what is the scope of for the general chemist or chemistry students in marine chemical ecology or ocean field? You're asking someone who is terribly biased on this. Uh, I would say that we need lots of people trained in chemistry to do marine biology work. This is because marine biology will expose you to very, very diverse organisms. And the more diverse the organisms, the more diverse the chemistry. So marine natural products have some remarkable diversities. And I think studying them requires, uh, I think, a natural products chemistry of the highest order. Yeah. Uh, another question from Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much for uh, taking so much of your time, even with your ill health. Uh, you have uh, reached us and reached all these participants. Uh, it was wonderful. You have inspired so many when you are there in the campus 
in 2017 and today i'm sure you are inspired so many more and definitely they will be continuing their studies in learning this interdisciplinary aspect of chemical ecology thank you so much for being part of us thank you thank you can i i'll stop to share yes sir yes sir thank you we have reached to the end of this webinar i take this opportunity to thank everyone who have been the part of this webinar i would like to express my gratitude to the management of our college for giving this opportunity to the staff and students of various colleges to interact through this online platform i wholeheartedly thank our principal reverend dr pravin martis sj for his support in initiating such events my special thanks goes to our resource person padma bhushan padma shri professor padmanabhan balaram for his informative session on chemical ecology with various perspectives towards its ecological aspects and also thank you sir for clarifying our doubts my thanks goes to dr richard ronald nazareth head undergraduate and postgraduate departments of chemistry for his innovative initiations to keep learning uninterrupted my thanks goes to ms nandini shet the coordinator of this international webinar and last but not the least my heartfelt thanks goes to all the participants for making this webinar a successful one with their presence and active participation thank you one and all participants kindly stay back for few instructions okay thank you thank you so thank much you. thank you so much <coughs> the feedback link will be posted posted just now in the chat box kindly fill the feedback uh, feedback form and then send it to us and you will receive the certificate for the webinar in a short while kindly note the next webinar will be by professor uday maitha from indian institute of science bangalore being a chemist i am sure all of you are very familiar with the science population program organized or the conducted by uh, professor uday maitha he is a renowned scientist international known scientist going to the different uh, institutions and inspiring people to take up science in general and chemistry in particular uh, the feedback i will share the feedback link now just fill up the form you may receive the field visual certificate by tomorrow please wait for a day uh, by tomorrow evening you will receive the certificate and same time after after a while i will just send the link for the next webinar the registration form for next webinar kindly register because it will be once again it is on the drug design is it the reality the topics will be it will be once again shared i will be sent uh, the link will be sent in the chat box this is the feedback link for you just do not post anything as on well now do not post the, any messages now so that everybody can go through this link of chemical ecology that is the feedback form now i have posted the link for webinar on 
10th August by Professor Uday Maita. The link what you have now is for the webinar 10 on August 7th, 2020. Topic is drug design. Is it really that easy? By Professor Rudai Mehta from Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore, a professor in organic chemistry. Kindly register using that link.